Okay, so what, what is OpenHFT? Um, it's an open source library which um, originally is born out of a number of technologies that I've worked on or developed for um, high frequency trading systems and um, trading systems for investment banks. And I decided that uh, it'd be worth making these libraries more generally available because they would be useful not just for high frequency trading, but in any system where um, you're likely to be testing the performance of your um, systems. <clears throat> First of all, what is high HFT or high frequency trading? Um, this is sort of an interesting question because it comes up quite often but without anyone really defining what it is. And the significance of that is that it's um, it's very relative. Uh, sometimes it is just, uh, if they've got a new HFT project, that just means that they wanted to go faster than the last time, the last project they had. Um, and uh, sometimes when people talk about HFT in one client, they'll, they'll be very different in orders of magnitude to another client. But the common factor is that they're all, um, the sort of latencies they're talking about are all too fast to see. It's not something you can visually measure. Um, your worst case latency should, shouldn't be visible to um, a human and um, it, they're all, another common factor is that they're all tied to profits. So um, you can tie the profitability of your system to how long they take. The slower they are, the more that they cost, um, cost the business. And in many cases they can make the difference between the business making money and losing money. Um, and certainly, um, in many cases, if the system didn't perform well enough, uh, the best thing you could do is switch it off. Because otherwise, if you, to keep leave it running slowly, you would um, just lose money all day. More money than just switching it off. So some examples of some HFT systems uh, for Java, which is, again, slightly different to what you might expect from C++. Um, but in the Java world, um, a HFT system is typically below 100 microseconds at least 90% of the time. And that's considered uh, reasonably good for Java systems. And another feature is that, um, that they won't be GCing during the day. So you run all day without a GC at all. Um, and the, the simple trick there is that they increase the interval between GCs to the point where it's almost 24 hours. So they might. Because a lot of trading systems, they can have a window, a downtime every day. Um, and so, uh, so, like one of the systems I worked on, it would do a full GC at 5 o'clock every morning. That was it. That was the only GC it did. Um, uh, and it was a scheduled task, in fact. Um, however, there's a lot of trading systems that are much more in the, the medium frequency space. And I have quite a few clients here. And they're more looking at trying to be under a millisecond 95% of the time. And they can tolerate the occasional minor collection. And I have some clients who are actually up in this space where they, they, they're getting uh, multi-millisecond delays um, of, uh, say, up to 10 milliseconds uh, 100 times. And they see uh, GCs every few minutes as being acceptable. Um, yes, I'm going to make a point. I forgot what it was. Uh, by the way, to get to get uh, this under 100 microseconds, a high percentage of the time, their typical latencies are in the region of uh, 20 to 35 microseconds, and that's external to the system. This is not how long it takes in software. This is if you were to measure a packet coming in or out external to their network. Uh, what would you see as a round trip latency? So it includes things like network routers and any other piece of hardware within their organization. So this is everything. Why use Java at all? Another question because uh, some organizations believe that high frequency training systems can only be done in C. Um, but that's uh, changing and you're finding that unless you're talking about equities, this is becoming less and less true. Most FX systems are in Java that I come up, I've seen. Um, certainly when you come to fixed income or commodities, they're not as latency sensitive. 
and uh, things such as shorter time to market matter, um, having more developers, there's, there's three times as many uh, Java developers in London as there is C++ developers, um, well, greater access to open source libraries. Uh, the big problem with a C++ library is that the worst thing a C++ library can do is seg fault your system. The worst thing a Java library can do, generally speaking, is throw an exception in one thread which you can catch. So your threshold to accepting an external library is a lot um, more stringent in C++. You're much more reluctant to accept someone else's code if you haven't read it and understood it and tested it quite thoroughly yourself. So therefore, you're much more less likely to just take an external library. You can, you can take on a library that was written for a 32-bit machine 10 years ago, and if it basically does the job, that, and it's not for a critical part of your system, that's fine, you know, it works, does the job, and it will still be optimized for your 64-bit uh, platform because the JVM will re-optimize the compiled code. Um, uh, the other thing is that um, in uh, FX markets and um, fixed income markets, the exchange is usually at least 10 times slower than, than a, a decent Java system. So trying to scratch out a few more microseconds by using C++ doesn't really add a lot of value when, in fact, depending on how you use the exchange, if you can use the exchange with a bit more creativity, you can save hundreds of microseconds, far more than you can save uh, in C++. And uh, I've known this from first-hand experience. We had, um, we had a sort of sister company, sister, uh, a similar company which we knew was using the same strategies as us, um, mainly because uh, I'm pretty sure our guys sort of took inspiration, shall we say, from them. And um, we, we competed very favorably with them because uh, we uh, made uh, better use of the exchange. And we had time to do that because we weren't spending so much time trying to optimize the trading system. So, okay. Don't know what that slide was. Okay, so uh, this is um, one of the major libraries used in HFT, which is Open HFT, which is Chronicle. Uh, Chronicle came from a um, was based on an idea I had at, uh, for when developing a, a white-labeled exchange for one company I worked for. And um, I sort of basically rewrote it, stripped it down to only the sort of the essential bits, but also made it more generic, so it was useful for more applications than what I had done originally. So, um, so what it does is it uh, is a very fast embedded persistence in Java. Uh, so you, your typical latencies are a sub-microsecond. So you can, you can write out persisted mess that messages that get persisted uh, in the, as low as 0.1 microseconds, which is pretty fast uh, in, in any, any language. Um, it's very simple, but also very low level by design. So um, probably the most off-putting thing about it is that it is very low level, much lower level than most Java developers generally um, experience. Okay, so where does it come from? It was uh, used um, for uh, an FX trading, something like this was used for an FX trading system originally, uh, which it was uh, high frequency, um, low latency, but not particularly high throughput. Uh, FX systems might get uh, in the order of 300 market updates a second, which really isn't very much, but you want to respond to every one of those updates extremely quickly, like less than 100 microseconds. Um, later it was used for uh, training systems that then handle high throughput. So um, typical training systems at the high end of Chronicle are in the thousands of events per second, and this is an uh, average. Um, and they could do this all day. Um, so what makes it, one of the things that makes it particularly interesting is that you can write out thousands, millions of records and uh, without triggering any garbage at all. So it doesn't, um, each message uh, can be written out um, 
without creating objects and also you can parse these messages without creating any objects as well. Um, which is a key, one of the key things which allows it to get the very high performance that it does. But it also relieves a lot of GC pressure on your application. Um, Logging um, can be as much as a third of all the garbage in your system and by converting to using something like Chronicle you can reduce the amount of garbage you're creating, the lot, the um, how often the GCs are triggered and um, you reduce your pause times. Uh, it's also uh, designed to be lockless, it supports text and binary and it also has rep uh, TCP replication which is interesting in the sense that it can be used um, for um, uh, inter uh, not only uh, IPC, inter-process communication on the same box, but it can also be used as a um, replication to another machine. And I have one client where they go from machine A to machine B, they do a response in machine B and then send it back to machine A again, and 99% of the time they get um, under 25 microseconds. When you consider that's four persistences, two TCP hops, um, and, that's, and that's one in a hundred worst. Uh, that's that's pretty good turnaround time. Um, that includes their cost of serializing messages as well. That's uh, one of the investment banks. Uh, yes, and it's free, but you can pay for training consulting if you like. That's in the wrong place, but anyway. Um, okay, so what is the most common use case for Chronicle? It wasn't what I was originally intending, but uh, a lot of people found that the easiest way to get started using it is uh, just as a low latency <coughs> logger, where they can log a lot more data without uh, slowing down the system. Because even, even if you're writing out text, you're looking at, uh, on a slow machine, you're looking at uh, less than two microseconds to write out a decent text message. Uh, if you write out binary on a on a fast system, like I said, you're looking at um, you know close to 0.1 millisec microseconds. Um, and the nice thing is that uh, if you start using it this way, it's pretty self-contained within your application. You can start with just a few lines of code, some critical message that's written a lot. Uh, you want to save out to a file. Uh, what it was originally intended for. Well, and how it was used initially was as a uh, inter-process communication um, uh, for uh, via shared memory, where every message in and out was persisted. Um, uh, this was used for trading systems where uh, it was useful to record every message and also record the timings of every message uh, going through the system so that you can analyze and find uh, slow points in the system so, uh, for example, we would take uh, 10 different timestamps at different stages throughout the system, uh, look at all the high percentiles when, the, when, when any individual event was running slow, and then track down to the exact phase where the delays were coming from. Um, and that shows up, issue, and that can be run in production, right? So it's very low overhead, so you run it in production, and then you get information that no profiler will give you uh, about trying to track down the exact source of any any sort of uh, jitter in your system. So, as I mentioned, um, it's it, it it's expected that you will want to record um, microsecond resolution timestamps at many different stages in the system, and um, something that's being used more for recently is being able to replay production data. So the nice thing about it is that um, once you've got a record of all your inputs and your outputs, you can replay an entire day's worth of data, so you've got a canned set of data, you can replay, re reproduce the exact state of the system at any point in the day. And so if you have some issue that occurred at, I don't know, 12 o'clock, and um, you don't know exactly all the sequence of events that got it to that stage, you can just replay it to that point um, without any difficulty. Uh, and in fact, with TCP replication, you can you can have a test replaying the same data as production is as it happens. So you can have your test system running in sync with production, and just see how it behaves. Uh, 
Uh, it's also good for uh, regression testing you know, any, any performance improvements. So you can run it through a few days' data. I've got one client's got five years' worth of data, <laughs> which seems like a bit extreme. It's about 100 terabytes, um, <laughs> which is quite a bit. It's not using Chronicle, but um, to give uh, some idea, the, 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 you know, it is, it, some clients like to be able to replay an enormous amount of data and then run it through the system and then see that it behaves correctly. Uh, Peter, do you have to play it back at the same speed? Uh, no. Uh, in fact, the default behavior is to play it as fast as it possibly can. Mm -hmm. So you actually have to put some throttle in, uh, look at the timestamp. So a common thing you might do is you might look at the timestamp and say, uh, um, if it's a short delay, wait for that amount of time. But if it's longer than, say, 100 milliseconds, then it doesn't really matter at this point. 100 milliseconds, 10 seconds, it's all the same. So you skip those. So you just make it 100 milliseconds at most. And that allows you to replay in a sort of almost real-time, realistic fashion, but still cut down a whole day's worth of events to maybe an hour. And then there's the option, of course, to re replay it faster than real-time. Um, and so running it between 10 and 30 times can be practical. Much beyond 30 times is, it can be quite challenging. So here's an example of the code. Uh, as you can see, it's quite low level in the sense that you're actually writing out each little piece of data. You actually say, right, I want to start an entry. Now this is the data I want to route out. And then when you finish it, then that commits it. It writes it into the index, and at this point, it's immediately visible to another process. By immediately, I mean less than 100 nanoseconds later. Um, the test that I've done is it estimates around 50 nanoseconds that it takes between when finish is called and when you can actually start reading this record in another process, or another thread for that matter. So here's an example of reading. Uh, a couple of things to note is that it uses busy waiting, so you have to poll it because there's no inter-process signal supported in Java. And um, uh, then you read out each of the individual records. So this, these uh, method handles are actually from data input, which is a standard interface uh, object input. And uh, in fact, you can um, do um, you can have externalizable objects read and written to this without any extra work to done. And then this finish actually checks that you haven't exceeded your bounds. So one of the things it does to speed up the process is it skips all the bounds checking, which is slightly interesting. OK, so what sort of throughputs do you get? Um, this was run on a, uh, an i7 with a fast SSD. And you can see that even with an SSD, uh, writing to an ext 4 file system makes a difference. Um, but you can write to tempfs, and that shows you just the raw overhead of the, of the application itself. Um, I'm also testing here very small messages, because this is where the overhead of the Chronicle itself is the most visible. Uh, once you get to bigger messages, your bottleneck is pretty much the uh, IO bandwidth of your device. So, uh, so as, as you can see here, it's getting in the region of about 800 megabytes a second, which um, not many devices can sustain much higher than that. Uh, this, I think, was using a PCI SSD card to, um, to get that kind of level. Um, this is the, uh, that's the a real message. Um, there's a bit of overhead in there because it has to do record a bit of extra information like where the messages start and end and, and things like that. And that's why it's not um, the drive itself can only do 900 megabytes a second. Uh, what might be interesting is I test this with a, a deliberately small heap to see whether I get any uh, GCs. So these tests were run with uh, 100 million messages uh, or more in these cases, and um, um, with a 32 meg heap, it still didn't have a minor collection. And the reason why is, if you have a look here, um, this is creating a bunch of objects, there's about 10. This is creating one object, and that's it. None of these other statements create any objects whatsoever. 
So you are creating some objects and some garbage, but it's like 10, 20 objects at most. And they're small. And it doesn't matter how long this loop runs. It just keeps writing out more data. No objects have been created or discarded. Uh, same with reading in. Um, it's about the same on startup. And then after that, um, this is just reading in raw primitives, all these checks. So again, no, no objects have been created or discarded. So there's no GC being triggered. Peter, are you bound to using uh, primitives? Uh, uh, no, there is support for objects. So you can, for example, populate mutable objects. And it also has support for object pooling. So uh, if you read a string, you can tell it to use an object pool. And uh, then uh, as long as you tend to have the same strings again and again, it will create some objects and some garbage, but it keeps it to a minimum. Yeah. Um, if you've got a, a field which is like the same 10 or 20 strings all the time, it'll create those objects and then no more after that. So you can, you can uh, actually reduce it. Um, it has the option to read into a string builder, for example. So um, instead of creating a new string, you just read into a string builder, it clears it and creates a new, just fills up the string builder, which is, of course, then recyclable. Okay. And that avoids creating any objects as well. That's an example of a mutable. Um, OK, so, so what happens uh, in terms of recovery? Uh, well, the critical function here is the finish at the end. That finish, once that has returned, the OS will do the rest, assuming it doesn't fail, of course. If the OS fails, then you're likely to lose some data, uh, unless in the default behavior. You can tell it to commit the message, though. You can force the message to go out to disk. Um, however, a lot of hardware tends to treat it as kind of a hint. So even though the OS is called force and um, it's tr sent the right signal out to the uh, device, sometimes the devices sort of go, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I get what you're trying to tell me, but uh, I'm trying to optimize for speed here, so um, I won't really do it. So uh, it, it, you're very much susceptible to the performance and the behavior of the hardware if you're uh, attempting to synchronize each record. But um, Chronicle has the option to, uh, Chronicle 2 anyway, has the option to uh, select on a message by message basis whether you want that message to be uh, synced or not. Uh, the default behavior is to not sync it. Uh, uh, so uh, if, if, uh, if you get an exception or it fails before finish is called, then it won't be written. So some data is written, but not the index. There's two files, there's a data file and an index file. And uh, without the entry in the index file on recovery, it just assumes it's not there and overwrites it. So the, the um, incomplete messages are pruned. Uh, another nice feature is it's cache friendly. So the very, very uh, last first byte of a message appears immediately after the last byte of the previous message. So it's all continuous in memory. There's no headers to worry about. Um, and uh, so you make best use of your caches and, and streaming through the caches. Caches are designed to do vector operations efficiently so they read and write through sequentially in memory very, very efficiently. As I said, once, once you get to large data sets, you your biggest bottleneck is just your write speed to disk. Your sustained write speed. So you can handle enormous bursts. So for example, the default behavior for um, Linux is that um, the disk cache, or, and Windows for that matter, the disk cache size, the amount it will allow you to get ahead of what's actually been written to disk is 10% of main memory. So say you've got a 32 gigabyte machine, without tuning it at all, you can be up to three gigabytes ahead of what's on disk. That means that you can have a burst of three gigabytes before you even start to be slowed down by how fast your disk is. And three gigabytes of logging is, an, is quite a lot. And um, the sort of rates that you have to be to be ahead of your disk um, are quite high. Now, 
The thing to be aware of is, of course, say, say you're getting your data down a one gigabit line, to accumulate three gigabytes will take you about 30 seconds. So if you log every packet coming down a one gigabit line, and you write it to disk, then that it will take you 30 seconds to get about three gigabytes. So that's, um, unless you've got a very high transfer rate, you, you very rarely exceed your buffer size, unless you're doing micro benchmarks like me. Um, there's always the option to increase that threshold, by the way. And in some tests, I set it up to 80%. And I got a machine with 128 gigabytes, so it gets very large. So how is garbage collected? Now, one of the built-in assumptions is that there's some sort of regular maintenance cycle, say, either on a daily or weekly basis. Uh, this doesn't always hold, um, and uh, there's a new version coming up which will allow rolling of files on a more routine basis, say every hour or whatever you decide to set it to. But at the moment, um, the current version um, is, is ex it pretty much expects to be done on a daily basis in the sense that the actual rolling of the files is quite ugly and expensive. By expensive, I mean it can take milliseconds. <laughs> And, um, and at that point, you roll the files over, you start using the new files, and you just keep writing from there. Um, in the new version, it's done transparently. Uh, you don't need to know that it's had to roll them over. And this is important for things like replication, because replication is a real pain if you're doing maintaining the rolling yourself. Uh, whereas if you, it's all done transparently and the replication's done transparently, that would be a lot nicer to use. Is there a lower level API? I don't get this question very often, but I answer it anyway. Um, uh, yes, there is. You can um, get down really low level and start uh, doing things like um, uh, thread safe accesses, um, control the serialization and deserialization with like, compressed types. So, some of the, like, if you think uh, using 64 bits for a long is a bit long. You can, there's a number of different compressed formats so you can save a few bytes on each message. Um, there's a couple of different ways of writing out strings, for example. Is there a higher API, level API? And this is what tends to be used. There is a high level API and what that does is it uses interfaces. So you have an interface which you code to. Under the interface it does all this reading and writing and hiding of all the, the low level stuff. Um, but all the other developers just work to an interface. And um, there's a demo, a Chronicle demo program in OpenHFT which supports this. And uh, you uh, write out to an interface here, but it actually goes to a Chronicle. This, uh, there's a reader here which goes and calls the same interface as a listener. So you, this processing engine implements that interface. So you can actually test this by taking all the Chronicles out and it still functions correctly. The Chronicle is just a bridge, a way of persisting all the calls that are made to an interface. Um, what, what it also does is it records metadata. So it's not just the message and the commands you wanted to send, but all the information, like all the history, all the timings, how did I get to this point? So you can, you can do um, low-level diagnosis of uh, any delay or jitter in the system. Any questions about this? Good time to take a pause. Is, is it being used anywhere else except apart from high frequency trading? Uh, well, it's used um, in a number of banks. Yeah. Um, that's uh, uh, trying to think. It's not used widely outside finance. The, the only ones I know of are people just using it as a simple logger, um, as a faster logger, because because it's fast enough that you don't need to turn off debug logging. You can just log absolutely everything in the system, yeah. and some people like having access to all of that. Um, because particularly if they've had to turn off logging in production and they've been burnt and then they had to go back and diagnose it but it's too late now because the event's gone. Mm -hmm. with, uh, with, with a log everything model, you don't need to worry about that. You can always go back and look at anything that's happened within, well, basically the limits of your disk space. I, I was just thinking, it, to me it seems like it has an application in uh, digital hardware uh, simulation in the chip industry. Uh, yeah, I, I, yes, that's a good idea. I haven't, yeah. I haven't seen that happen. Yeah. 
Any, any more questions? If you um, if you can't tolerate even a single garbage collection, yes. Why are you even using jar? I mean, ah, because you it, can't you can't use any like object orientation or anything because everything anything you put on the heap could trigger a garbage collection. Right? Well, these are all object oriented. These are all object oriented methods, right? But you can't use any sort of. Um, uh, you've got all the. You can still use all the standard libraries as long as they don't produce more garbage than your Eden site. So say you create a twenty. Oh, so you're not counting Eden collections? That's all right. So. No, I, you might say you can set your Eden sites to say twenty four gig, oh, right? right? That gives you a budget of twenty four gigabytes of garbage you can produce in a day. And as long as you've got libraries that produce less than that in a day, you won't trigger any collection. Does it does it cause any sort of performance impact having such a giant getting gigantic sort of Eden size or is it all is that all not fine? really uh, well you do once you go much beyond that yes it does because what happens is that you uh, can no longer use compressed loops right. and compressed loops gives you 32-bit references which can address up to 32 gigabytes using a couple of tricks it does with the, the way it stores references um, uh, so if you go to say 64 gigabytes in Java 7, you'll see that the memory consumption jumps by almost 50%. The, so you, you um, uh, one estimate is that if you want to get more memory than 32 gigabytes, you actually have to go to 48 because you will have lost so much with all the 64-bit references that it then has to have. So there, there's some sort of indirect effects, but um, the time it takes to collect eight gigabytes Eden of just just empty objects that are all going to be thrown away compared to eight megabytes is it takes twice as long. Okay. It's not really a big jump. The biggest jump is how many objects are kept, how many objects are going to be copied and collected and need to be referenced. So the less objects that you have um, that survive Eden space, the lower the cost uh, to the point where it almost doesn't matter if you have a huge collection. The other thing is, uh, in these systems, you, you will have, say, a full GC overnight. So, and that might take one to two seconds. Um, but that's acceptable because it's in a maintenance window when you're not trading anyway. Um, what some systems do if they're providing a service is that they will shut them down. So you've got multiple machines. You take one of them out of the set. Uh, you do a GC on it, bring it back into the set, and then you just rotate through. And then, the, so then externally, you don't see any, uh, uh, none, you still get a 24 hour service, even though you've had to do full GCs. Uh, some do this um, even predictively. So they haven't gone to this extreme. They expect regular GCs every few minutes. And what they'll, they will just do this on a rotating basis all through the day. And then that prevents any uh, long running GCs to occur. Uh, for web requests, for example. The functional uh, constructs in Java. Uh, well, one of, one of the, the issues, you, you well, one of the issues you have with functional programming is that functional programming is largely about, based around immutability and immutable objects. Mm -hmm. So there's one common pattern is to use immutable objects to um, get, to simplify your concurrency models. Because if you've got an object that never changes, um, its thread safety is less of an issue. It's much easier to reason about. The problem with using immutable objects is that you end up having to create a lot more of them. And so you end up creating a lot of garbage as a result. So um, Java isn't strictly, a it's not a functional language. Mm. So even though it's got sort of functional type things like closures, it doesn't force you to use immutable objects like, say, um, Closure does, or um, Erlang does, or, uh, and so you can actually use mutable objects with function uh, closures in, in Java, and uh, so you end up with a sort of a bit of a hybrid, um, which isn't ideal, but it does mean that if you want to do the recycling of the objects yourself, you still have that control, and that's that's one of the ways to prevent or reduce the amount of garbage you produce is to do the recycling yourself. Mm. Then you'd lose that control if you went for immutable objects. If you went to immutable objects, you can't reuse the objects yourself. Yeah. You have to let it do the reusing. Mm -hmm. um, the reason this is a particular problem is, um, is just in um, cache friendliness. 
So the thing is, um, in, a, in a web application, um, you might expect that if you're producing less than about 300 megabytes of garbage a second, you might be pausing less than 5% of the time. So you're getting a good throughput through your system. Right? But at 300 megabytes a second, you're actually filling your L1 caches in as little as 0.1 milliseconds. So that means if you want to go and access something that was there 0.1 milliseconds ago, it's already gone. It's gone in the L2, L3 caches. Mm. The problem with L3 caches is that it's shared. So now you've lost all scalability in terms of all your CPUs and cores. So you don't want to be touching your L3 cache. The other thing is your L3 cache is 10 to 20 times slower than your L1 cache. So you really want to be spending as much time as you're possible in your L1 and your L2 cache. Otherwise, all of the scalability work, all of the work you did to use all of the cores in your system is, is lost. You can end up with a multi-threaded application that's using all the CPUs, but it's slower than just using one CPU on your system. Because the one CPU can spend less, more time in its um, cache and not have so much contention. So, um, so yes, by reducing your garbage, you use your caches more efficiently. You're not constantly scrolling through your caches, pushing, pushing all the, or anything of any use in the cache out with the garbage, as it were. And uh, you, your application can run two to five times faster. So uh, a trading system I was working on in Frankfurt, um, we sped up the system by 10 times just by reducing their garbage in a couple of key places, not many, about a dozen key places. The other thing we did was reduce the number of threads they had. They had uh, 5,700 threads doing all these different things. Um, and I said, uh, how about we have one, right? So we took all the critical functionality, some of the support functionality was still there, but we took all the critical functionality and ran it through one thread. We reduced the garbage and uh, we reduced their 99th percentile by a factor of 20 by doing that. Right? So by getting, using less, res um, getting uh, uh, a simpler system uh, running more efficiently can do more for your performance than just saying, right, we'll use lots of threads, therefore it must be faster. Mm -hmm. We'll use, uh, you know, we'll just tune the, gar the GC, that, that, will, that will solve our garbage problem. But in reality, you're, you're hurting every individual instruction by, by not using your caches. Um, that example you just gave, obviously it's a fairly big improvement, but it would be, I imagine, a bit of investment in time. How did you go about working out uh, ahead of time that that was a worthwhile activity? Uh, it was from experience. I mean, you just look at a system with 5,700 threads and you know that's quite a lot. Um, and uh, uh, they were also seeing very enormous uh, spikes that weren't even GC related. They were seeing big spikes to do with GCs but a lot of them weren't even GC related. Scheduling, things like that, or? Scheduling um, uh, locking contention. So if your locking contention largely goes away if you've only got one thread anyway. Right? It doesn't need to lock anything anymore. Right? There's no contention anymore. So, and, and in particular, if you're trying to bring down your worst case, it also reduced down their average, but it was their worst case that was hurting them. So, because that was visible to users, that was the main thing, right? They wanted their pauses to get so low that, that no longer, the users could no longer see it. And at that point, it no longer really mattered, because um, that was their, their test criteria. Uh, you know, users stopped complaining about pauses in the system. So, um, yeah. Any other more questions on this topic? Okay, so this, uh, this is a uh, new old library. So this is um, one of my first open source libraries, which was pretty much just a prototype. It didn't go very far, but it had one thing that was particularly valuable to me, which was that I used um, byte buffers to store uh, data off heap. The reason that was significant was that six months later, Terracotta got a patent for doing exactly that. 
uh, which then prevented anyone else uh, providing such a solution. But because I had prior art, um, I was able to uh, develop that. So uh, Terracotta have a big memory uh, solution, which is commercial. And uh, to date, I'm the only one that's released a competing product because everyone else has been put off by the fact they've got a patent, uh, which I don't need to worry about, fortunately. So, um, so what does uh, so I've uh, redeveloped it and turned it into something that's actually a bit more useful because um, I've had a lot of time to think about how I should do that. And so there's two main classes that come out of that. One is a huge hash map which is entirely off heap, or well, almost entirely off heap, it's mostly off heap. Um, it's volatile in the sense it's not persisted and it's private to an individual process. Uh, it's nice, it's relatively simple to use and the big advantage is that it's, the easy, it's fairly easy to tune. Um, more recently, and in fact, uh, there's only really been sort of like a release quality version in the last week or so, uh, is a, a library called Shared Hash Map. Now the thing that makes Shared Hash Map interesting uh, is not just because of what it does, but the fact that it does things that you wouldn't normally see in Java. And that is that this ha Shared Hash Map is shared between processes. So multiple processes can use this Shared Hash Map at the same time. And uh, visibility of the data is very similar to Chronicle in the sense that as soon as you've written to an entry in one process, it's available to another process within about 50 nanoseconds. Um, uh, it's also uh, potentially persisted, so you can either write it to a tempfs file system, in which case it's not persisted, and as we saw before, um, you do get better throughputs writing to tempfs, um, or it can be written to a uh, AXD force file system, it's the only one I've tested uh, on Unix, and um, you still get very decent uh, performance. Uh, I've actually tested this to uh, both of them to two and a half billion entries. Uh, so it can scale to very large sizes. Concurrent hash map, for example, is limited to uh, maxint, even in theory, although I've never seen it done in practice. Um, whereas um, this can go beyond maxint in terms of number of entries. Um, it also supports concurrent access and you get in the order of uh, a few million operations per second per core. So it scales surprisingly well, um, since I hadn't optimized for that particularly much, but um, I get good scalability. I've tested it for um, 16 cores with hyper-threading and it scales pretty well. So uh, hopefully you can see the code here, or at least get the gist of it. So, uh, because, uh, as I mentioned, shared hash map has the problem that there's quite a few levers to pull, or you might want to pull because uh, it's reasonably low level and there's lots of things you can play with. So it has a builder, so you can set a bunch of different parameters, and then you say, right, I want to create a map. This is the location, either on disk or in tempfs, and this is the key and the value type. And then you get back what is a map. It has a bunch of other methods that make it a little bit special. So you may want to keep the fact that it's a shared hash map, but otherwise it supports the entire concurrent map interface. So you can just use it as an ordinary map. And in fact, at the moment, as we speak, um, there's a couple of guys developing a JCash solution for InfiniSpand for Red Hat based on it. So once you create your map, what can you do with it? Um, you can create what, what I've called an off-heap reference. So what you do is you give it an interface of getters and setters and a few other methods that are support, and it goes and generates a reference to an off-heap entry. So even though it looks like uh, you've got just a bunch of getters and setters and you get elements of, the, of an array and you set values on there, all of these are actually going off-heap in terms of where they're stored. So as soon as you get down to here, that's it. There's nothing actually to do, anything further to do. It's actually been written out at this point. If your application crashes on that line, like does a full JVM crash, not just an exception, it will still get written out to disk. Nothing more for the application to do. So it's, it's really just a matter of writing out to memory each of these statements. 
And that's why it's so fast, because you get the same performance that you would get with a native object in Java. The interfaces are much the same, the code looks much the same, um, but you get a lot of other benefits as well, the, the persistence the, uh, uh, and the sharing with other processes and threads. Uh, there's a couple of, there's this funny method here, which is, which is one I've added called acquire using. And this is where the mutability comes into it. So instead what it, what it does, it does two things, is it looks to see whether this keyed value exists or not. And if it doesn't, it goes and creates it. And it goes and sets this mutable object to be that. So by using acquire using or get using, you're reusing an object every time. So you're not creating a new object when you serialize or deserialize it. Um, and this is using these sort of techniques is how you avoid creating any objects at all for the entire life cycle of the uh, application. So when I was talking about the two and a half billion entries, it was actually, I got it a bit further on, it's actually running with a I think it did it with a 64 megabyte heap, um, no GCs, right? So even though I've got less than one byte per key value, still doesn't GC because it's producing so little garbage on a per message basis. So, so are you, um, sorry for interrupting, are you, do you ration out the amount of objects you're going to use? Do you have like an array of allowable or, or a list of available objects? Uh, I do. What I do is that on a per message basis, like on startup it may create quite a few objects and rare events may create quite a few objects like polling the file system or something yeah. like that. But on a per message basis, my aim is to produce on average less than one object for the entire processing of that message. And you record what the number was so you can reuse it again if you have to. Um, no, I make sure there's less than one so then oh, it's, okay. uh, it's pretty much zero then you're just rationing yourself that you'll, you'll never die before the end of the day. Sort of. Yes, yes. So uh, I'll, I'll, I can show you another chart where I've actually <coughs> shown the I chart the Eden's usage over the day. And you can see that when it's trading, its usage doesn't really go up. The, mm. It's all the background tasks that are actually using the garbage. Um, uh, we were running in an OSGI container, and obviously you can't get OSGI for C++. And uh, that allowed us to load and unload software on the fly when the application was running. So while, while we had the trading system up and running, we were able to um, load in new versions of software and bring them in and take out old versions of software using OSGI. Um, none of that would have been possible in C++. Well, it's possible in theory, but it's a lot harder. Um, and then, of course, OSGI is not designed for low latency or low GC or any of those sorts of things, but it was low enough that it was well within our budget, so we didn't worry about it. We were able to leverage, you know, normal, naturally written Java code, but um, because it wasn't part of the critical path, because OSGI, what it does when it's not being used, it allows you to just step out of the way and do whatever your application needs to do, um, it didn't matter. Have you got any idea of the overhead that OSGI does add to the system? Uh, if you, it depends on what you're doing. If you, we were using a library called iPojo, uh, which made life a lot easier in terms of configuring and wiring up and events of components appearing and disappearing. The default behavior for uh, iPojo is kind of expensive. But it has a simple mechanism for turning off all its event notification. It has event notification for whenever it enters a method and when it exits. And this creates a, an object array, even if you've got no arguments. It creates a, a no argument object array and then says, oh, there's no listeners for this to pass to, therefore I'll just throw it away. Right? So it does a lot of this sort of fairly wasteful object creation. But there's a simple method for turning them all off. And then once you've done that, there's almost no overhead at all. Um, so once you've got over the wiring phase uh, and it's in a uh, real runtime, it's very little overhead at all. Indeed, yeah. It, it, it's just um, it, it, there's a little bit of how you use it, but it, it, if you just use it a um, certain way, you can eliminate it as uh, even an issue, even in a HFT system. So, yeah. Uh, 
you've shown a shared um, uh, hash map. Do you want to do, do you have a shared array list, or do you just use a shared hash map to say you draw one as the key? Yeah, I've got a I've got an array list, but again, it's not shared. It's uh, more like the huge uh, hash map. Um, however, the yes, there is the option. I mean, obviously, this is the first uh, collection which seemed an obvious thing to include. Um, I probably wouldn't go for an array list because the big problem with array list, if you've got a big enough collection, is you take out one element, the whole thing shuffles down, which would be a real pain performance-wise and big performance hit. The nice thing about um, the shared hash map is that it's concurrent, so you can have a high number of threads accessing it at the same time, which again is tricky to do in an array list. What would be more useful, I think, would be a shared queue. So you've got some number of threads all throwing in jobs to a queue and then another, um, another set of threads trying to consume jobs out of that queue. That would be very useful, and that's probably be the next library uh, class will go into this module. Um, so yeah. Yeah. I have two questions on, on the shared hash map. Um, publishing order. How do you do? We have to if we're using this, do we have to take any care in terms of making sure that the is there any method we have to call to make sure that everything is effectively published in the right order? Uh, yes. In terms of thread safety, there is some support for that. Uh, I don't know if I've got an example here. So get gets this out. So again, it's fairly normal code. Didn't want to go into too much depth on it, but yes, you um, what you can do is you can add a field to um, uh, under the bond of an integer. But you add a field to an entry, and you can use it as a lock. So there's not just getters and setters. There's also busy lock, try lock, unlock. And as long as you do a lock and unlock on it, then that ensures that all the right memory barriers are performed and that you've locked that individual entry. And the nice thing about that is you've got very fine grain uh, locking. So as long as no other thread is trying to use that, that exact entry, that it doesn't need to block, which is quite nice. Um, if you want to, you can actually have multiple locks, although that is likely to be unnecessarily complicated and you get issues of things like false sharing and um, it's probably very tricky to get right if you use more than one lock per entry you could. Yeah, secondary question, um, pointer chasing effectively, do you, do you advise using only primitives with this hash map or how do you manage some uh, things like that? These, these, well in this example for ex uh, I've got um, this is how it handles arrays. So instead of having arrays literally because of the heap objects, what you do is you give it a get with an index. So in this case, an index of zero and one, uh, that will get out um, the, the ith element. Um, there's also a set with index. So this gets with index this entry, and then um, this is a nested object or a nested off heap object. And um, so it's then getting some of the values out. Uh, in the previous example, it's getting the ith element of this array and um, setting, in this case, the same fields. So those are located next to each other? Yeah, they're all consecutive in memory, in reality. So they're all blocked together. They will never be rearranged. Uh, they, uh, so they're cache friendly in that sense. There's no overhead. There's no headers in between. So 16-bit um, JVM has a 16-byte header. This is part of the reason why it has much uh, lower memory consumption because none of all those headers disappear, um, uh, which means that if you do want locking, you actually have to add it yourself as an extra field. Whereas, of course, uh, in of Java objects, uh, the locking is is a built-in field. <coughs> so, are those arrays fixed size? Uh, at the moment, they are yes. However, one of the things that's a bit interesting, well, I find interesting about off-heap memory is unlike heap memory, with heap memory, the memory is allocated eagerly, which means that when you ask for a megabyte, you get a megabyte. That will be a megabyte of memory. And if that gets swapped to disk, that will be a megabyte on disk. Right? If you ask for a megabyte of off-heap, you get a megabyte of virtual memory. But until you touch any of it, uh, until you touch any of those pages, it won't turn into physical memory. Until you touch any of those pages, it will not go to disk either. And so I've got an example 
one of the example programs I have, um, I create a uh, shared hash map which is 125, 20, uh, 137 gigabytes of memory. And I put a thousand entries in it and it's only using 21 megabytes of actual memory or disk space because that's the bits that got touched. So the nice thing about it is that you can give it, um, you can ask it for a lot more than you probably will ever need. But then it works out which pages you actually ever used and only those pages get allocated. And this is all done by the OS. It's not something you have to worry about. That all the JVM has to worry about. The OS is smart enough because it's not um, managed memory anymore. It's smart enough to say, right, these pages you used, 4K blocks, these ones you didn't. So you can say, for example, make all of your um, entries. So one of the problems is that the entry size for each shared hash map is limited. You, whatever you set it to, that's what it can be. You can't make it larger. Um, so, but what you can do is say, well, I'm going to make them all a megabyte. I'm only going to use like a few K most of the time, but I'll make it a megabyte just in case. And what happens is that only a megabyte, the, only the pages you used actually get allocated either in memory or on disk. And of course, with your caches, caches are even more efficient. They, they do it in multiples of 64 bytes. And the, your cache is often the most critical resource because no matter how much memory you've got, your L1 cache is going to be 32 kilobytes. Your L2 cache is 256, even in the most expensive Xeon, later Xeons you can buy. Those, they're your precious resources. And so, um, so it, it, be, it becomes interesting that you think about how you use memory a little bit differently um, because you can um, just give it like big regions, far bigger than your main memory size, which again is not really possible with a heap. Uh, I don't know if you've ever tried uh, specifying a heap larger than your main memory size, but it's not pleasant, especially on Windows. Uh, you're, uh, Linux, you're lucky if you can kill the process. On Windows, you're probably going to have to power cycle a box just to get control back. So exceeding your, your main memory size with heap is just really bad. <coughs> Whereas with this, uh, because you're, you're exceeding it only in virtual memory, it doesn't matter quite so much. You can, you can seriously overcommit your virtual memory to your main memory size. Do you end up with any kind of fragmentation by doing that? Uh, there is the potential for fragmentation with future versions which will handle variable length sizes, which it doesn't at the moment. But at the moment, because every entry is the same size, you, you, you can't get any fragmentation. What you can do is get fragmentation on disk. Because you're allocating pages at a time, you may get regions of the disk in different orders. But part of the reason for picking this data structure is it's designed to be random anyway, so there isn't a lot of advantage or disadvantage by, by being fragmented or not. If you're using the solid state disks, it probably doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, well, it matters even less there. It, it does still matter, surprisingly. A lot of solid state disks will give you better performance for sequential reads and writes compared to random ones. But um, not, a, not enough that I've noticed. Uh, in the tests that I've done with these, I get, I get the maximum write speed of my SSD, which is 900 megabytes a second. Sometimes I see it go slightly over for short periods of time, but it, it do, really does get the manufacturer's limit, so you can't do much better than that. Okay, so, uh, so, yeah, so there's my mention that if you see this notation, that's how it, ha it um, mocks arrays, because it can't, can't really do arrays because they're a heap of objects. But you get the same behavior by um, uh, by asking for an index, you do a get or a set with an index, and then it gives you a nested object, which of course can be of any type you want as right. So, so you have an interface for those as well. At the moment, you, it only supports one level of nesting. Uh, so, I'm sure we can all read that, but. Uh, What's interesting is this, this one fifth is if you're using really big, uh, um, really big uh, maps with 64-bit uh, references. In a 32-bit reference JVM, which is what most people would have, it's about three and a half times smaller. And there's also plans for multi-master replication. That's the next step for this class. And some of the code has already been written for that. That's where it will get particularly interesting because you'll be able to have 
the shared mash, hash map shared across multiple machines as well. So it becomes a sort of a distributed uh, database. Um, the difference is though, okay, so this is, um, this is a concurrent hash map. And uh, for this machine, interestingly, and what I found it interesting is that when I compared to another machine, I got quite different results. But on this machine, you can see that the throughput starts deteriorating up to about 200 million entries. And that's because you get ever increasing GC times. You just get more and more GC times as you get closer to the memory that the machine's got. Um, and it's not that concurrent hash map is slow, it's the fact that the GC is slow. And that's what's sucking a lot of the throughput out. Um, I'm not used to having tests where you can actually see a drop in throughput just from pauses. Usually the pauses are small enough that they have no impact on throughput and only interesting for latency levels. So I found this benchmark quite interesting. Um, this is using a, as you can see, the heap at 200 before it gave up it was 22 gigabytes. What, what tool are you using to monitor your garbage collection? Uh, this one I use for both GC. Okay, that was it. Just just read the logs. Um, if you just do for both GC, it doesn't give you a lot of information, but it gave me enough. Um, and in fact, uh, for some of my tests, I just look to see whether there's anything at all. Mm. So obviously in this case, it's pretty simple. Yeah. I see no log messages, that's good. Right. Um, so as you can see here though, um, the, the drop in throughput is much less. On this, on this machine, I was able to go up to 400 million entries and uh, what's not mentioned here oh yes the heap size was 64 meg right so it's a very small heap size very little impact on um, GC so if you're up got an application that is producing garbage this will not ha come into play it will not slow down your application as a result whereas in the previous example you've got an application that's producing garbage they're going to be interacting with each other and slowing each other down you're going to have a very large um, medium lived objects and they're the, they're the most expensive the medium lived objects and long lived objects um, whereas in this case they're, they're all off they're none of them, they're not, the GC doesn't even know they exist so um, well it's sort of plus but anyway um, and so the, the impact on the GC is, is trivial I think that's it uh, it works best under Linux, but it works under Windows in particular because a lot of my clients develop on Windows. So it needs to work fully under Windows. What Windows doesn't do quite so well is that it uh, eagerly allocates both memory and disk. So that thing I was telling you about, the lazy allocation, doesn't work under Windows. However, um, unless you're running really big production size data sets, um, the, the code will still work. You just need to be a little bit more conservative about how big <coughs> data sets you run under Windows. More memory and this space, and that will also achieve the same result. What's the code size overhead that you need to buy into before you get started with this? Um, I'm, I'm thinking about it in embedded applications where the disks a woefully slow, so yes. much slower than the hard spinning hard disk. Yeah. But the but the processes and the processes despite despite being really slow too, are much faster than the crappy memory that's in the embedded uh, I think the biggest restriction is that you need um, the standard edition. This won't run on ME, for example. Yeah, SE is not that big though. It's only about thirty two meg. Yeah. So in, in couldn't tell you off the top of my head how big the library is, but it's well under a megabyte. Oh, it's not. Um, it's not that big. That, that's with all of the dependencies. I put. Um, I can check that. I, I put SC and then ran a 50 meg Java jar file on this thing. So yes. you know, that's well, I know that memory map files work on Android, for example. Mm -hmm. That's the key thing. Is that it's the fact that it uses memory map files to do its storage, and um, then it leaves the OS to worry about how it flushes the memory map files onto disk or where it has to go. Um, 
and in particular it works very well for very bursty activity, um, even if you've got very slow um, disk. So I have one client, for example, they don't they don't even map to local disk, they looked, map to a NFS mounted SAN drive, which oh, no. has some really bad performance profiles if they were writing it out. Um, but uh, it works for them, it really smooths out their latencies. And I suppose that you're not talking about a multi spindle fiber channel. Well, they, they do have all of that, but yeah. it's a shared resource. Oh, so they see up to 300 millisecond pauses for a write. Which is not brilliant. Um, that's because they don't have control over all the things that it's being used for. They, they have such a small portion of its usage. Will it work on Linux 2.6 kernels? Uh, it. Uh, Do you need? Yes, 2.6. Um, it did once work on 2.5, but I haven't tested it for a while. Okay, but it might work on 2.6. It should work on 2.6. So I, I have people who have tested it for 2.6. It also works with 3.8, yeah. which is a more recent one. Yeah. Yes. Are your slides available? Uh, yes, I'll put them on SlideShare. Um, I've got a more in-depth presentation, which has had 10,000 hits, so you might be interested in that one as well. Well, I, I presented a Java one. No questions? All right. Join me in thanking Peter.